And all right, we're going to come back to Habakkuk chapter number 2. Let's turn over to 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter number 3. In the Old Testament getting towards the end, pretty close to the end of the Bible. Or I'm sorry, the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Look at verse number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 3 verse number 1 says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, the idea of this chapter here, beginning in the very beginning, Paul, uh, Peter says that he wants to bring certain things to the remembrance of those that are the recipients of the letter, those that he's addressing. And in the very beginning, you know, he starts to speak, hey, I want you to be mindful of the things which were spoken to you. And which were spoken by the prophets. He's speaking about the Old Testament scriptures. And were spoken by us, the apostles. Those are the authors of the New Testament scriptures. Those that spoke the word of God. Things that are actually considered to be prophecies. Things that are actually considered to be revelations. And that came directly from the Lord himself. But then he gets into something specific in verse number 3. He says this, knowing this first. So saying, I want to put this in priority right now. Knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. So he warns that there are going to come scoffers. What is a scoffer? It's a mocker. It would be used synonymous with someone that is mocking someone, right? So he's saying in the last days there are going to come people that are going to scoff and they're going to mock. Now what specifically are they going to mock? Look at verse number 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So these mockers or these scoffers, they're going to begin to mock specifically of, I thought Jesus Christ was coming back, right? Where is the promise of his coming is what they said. So Jesus Christ promised to come back. And they're going to mock and scoff that idea and they're going to say, hey, where is the promise of his coming? What happened about Jesus coming back? What happened about, you know, the fact that Jesus promised to come back to the earth one day, right? They're going to mock that and they're going to scoff at that. And what, for what reason? It's because such a long period of time has went by. I want you to look at the very next statement that they say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So they're saying since the fathers fell asleep, you know, since their fathers had passed away or died, and I'm not going to get into specifically what I, how I interpret that, but he says, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, saying nothing has changed. Saying that the world as it is today, this is what it's saying, the world as it is today is just going to continue as it, as it is now forever. The implication is that Jesus is never coming back. And what's the reason why they say that? Because they say that it's been such a long time. Since, since it's been such a long time, you know, where is the promise of His coming? They're trying to mock and scoff the idea of Christianity, of Jesus Christ's return, and saying that He's never going to come back because it's been such a long period of time. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of prophecies that tarry. Prophecies that tarry. Go back to Habakkuk chapter number 2 quickly. Keep your hand there though in 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. <clears throat> and I want to define a couple of things for you. This is where I de derive first off the, the title of the sermon. Habakkuk chapter number 2. Habakkuk chapter number 2. Look at verse number 3. It says this, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. 
Now, this verse is just an amazing verse that I've never heard anyone exposit and take apart. And I'm going to do a portion of that right now just briefly, but I want to come back to it towards the end of the sermon. But let me tell you this, that everyone agrees, uh, you know, as as far as Bible students, people that study the Bible, they know and they agree that this is 100% speaking about the end times. They know that this is without a doubt speaking about the end times. If you back up to verse number two, it tells you this. Give me some some, uh, water, please, Michaela. It's a horrible morning for me to have to, you know, lead the songs because I'm like already losing my voice. Look at verse number two. It says, And the Lord answered me, saying, Write the vision, and he says, And make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now this is specifically referring to the time of when tribulation begins and that people can be prepared to run. You know, this is actually referenced and as is Daniel in Matthew chapter number 24 where he he warns that you need to be prepared. Don't go back to get anything but be prepared to run. When you you know, he that reads it, he wants him to understand it and when you understand it and you read it, I want him to run. That's why he says it's important to make sure that it's, that it's plain, that it's easy to understand. But notice in verse number three, when he gets into the vision, he says, for the vision is yet, he says this, for an appointed time. So notice that God has a specific time when this is going to take place. You know, all of these major events that take place throughout history, and some of them being like the Messiah when he comes, right? Or when he came, the, let's say the first time. The Messiah when he comes the second time. God obviously has an overall plan and he knows when he is going to fulfill these things. And he, through his providence, has set up an order of events of when they're going to take place. They don't just randomly happen when so-and-so does this or maybe this person in history fulfills this. No, God has his hand in it providentially and he works these things out. And as it says here in verse number 3, there is an appointed time. That means there's a chosen time or a selected time when the end of the world will take place. It's not just random. And it says, but at the end it shall speak. So notice at the end, right? It's talking about the end of the world. It says it shall speak, saying it will come to pass. Now watch this at the very end. This is what I want to focus on here for a minute. Though it tarry. Now what does it mean to tarry? Saying like wait. Like it takes some time. That's his point. Though it tarries like waits, he says, wait for it. So though it tarries, you need to tarry for it. Just wait on it. Just have patience is his point. Though it tarries, if it doesn't come to pass right away, wait for it. Because, he says, it will surely come. He's saying it will surely come. Surely is, is like, is like uh, truthfully, basically, is what's being said. Definitely, certainly. He's saying because it will surely come. Saying it is going to come to pass. Just because it doesn't happen right away, you still need to wait for it. Because it will come. Now I want you to notice he said, though it tarry, right? Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. And then he says this, it will not tarry. So he makes that statement at the end after he'd already told you, though it tarry, you know, it will wait for it because it will surely come. Then he says at the end, it will not tarry. Then he makes this statement. So it seems almost contradictory. It seems like he's saying, it's going to tarry, wait for it, but it won't tarry. So obviously, you know, if we look at that on the surface, if we look at that on face value, we have two statements. One that's telling us it's not going to tarry, and the other saying that it's going to tarry. Within the same verse, basically two statements back to back. Now, the way to interpret this, and I'm going to show you this by Daniel chapter number 10, it's, very, it, it, it's really simple once you, you know, kind of grasp this concept. What does it mean to tarry again? It means to wait, that it's going to take a period of time, right? Right? It's going to take a period of time. It's, going to, uh, it's not going to happen immediately or right away. Though it tarry, he says, wait for it, because it will surely come. And then he repeats it, he says, it will not tarry. Look at the, the first phrase of this verse again, verse number three. For the vision, watch this, is yet for an appointed time. So what he means when he says, it will not tarry, At the very end, he's saying that when it's its time to come, it's not going to tarry. Because there is an appointed time for it. Now, to you, it may feel like there's this period of time that's just going by that's just waiting. Right? Where you're waiting for it to happen. But the Lord isn't waiting for that to happen. He already has out a selected time when the end will come. So he's not standing there waiting. He's not standing there tarrying. He already 
prior to this has an appointed time of when this is going to come to pass. And this is the point. Obviously, both cannot be true that it's tarrying and it's not tarrying. But from your perspective, it may feel like it's, wait, like it's tarrying, like it's being held back, like we're waiting on it, right? And it should have already happened. But that's not the case. It's, what it is is, you feel like it's tarrying, but it's not. It's just the appointed time is afar off. I want you to turn over to Isaiah. Actually, let's first go to Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter number 10. Daniel chapter number 10. I want you to notice how this same phrase is used a few different times about the you know, things to come to pass and prophecies. Look at Daniel chapter number 10 verse number 1. In the third year of Cyrus king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. That's a prophecy it's speaking of. Whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true. Watch this. But the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 60. Notice that the time appointed was a long, long period of time ahead. It was long, it says. Look at Isaiah chapter number 60. Isaiah chapter number 60. I'm going to be preaching this morning on prophecies that tarry. A lot of people don't understand prophecy. Now, the, the definition of the word prophecy and what that actually means would just be a revelation from the Lord. It would be a revelation that comes directly from the Lord. Men, they would speak or sometimes they would speak and then have it pinned down. And that's what we have in Scripture, of course. But they would speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And these would be words or revelations that come directly from the Lord. Sometimes when we use the word prophecy, we're speaking of end times events or we're speaking of future events that are to come to pass one day. That's what I'm going to be preaching about this morning. I'm going to be preaching about prophecies that are to come to pass. And in this case, I'm going to be using examples of prophecies that were prophesied of that came to pass. And I'm going to show you a pattern of prophecies that tarry. People oftentimes that aren't familiar with the Bible, people oftentimes that maybe, you know, uh, are atheists and things along those lines, they would be totally ignorant of just prophecies in general and how they come about, how they are fulfilled, and when they are fulfilled. Very often, more often than not, prophecies in the Bible, they don't just come to pass in that same generation or prophecies that are prophesied of don't just come to pass the next day, 30 days later, two years later. Most of the prophecies in the Bible that are prophesied of come to pass many, many years later. Yea, even hundreds, oftentimes thousands of years later. But guess what? They still came to pass. And just as it says in Habakkuk chapter number 2, surely it will come. Though it may feel like it's tarrying, it may feel like it's waiting from our perspective because we're waiting on this prophecy to come to pass, it's not really tarrying. It's not really just waiting to come. The Lord has an appointed time for these things to come to pass. Look at Isaiah chapter number 60, look at verse number 22. It says, a little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. And then it makes this statement. It's interesting. I, the Lord, will hasten it. Watch this. In his time. So what does it mean to hasten? It means to hurry something up. It means that when it's, it's time, then I'm going to bring it to pass. So notice that he's not just sitting back and just waiting, or maybe he's forgotten about this prophecy, like, oh, crap i got to like intervene and make sure that that comes to pass. That's not how it works. The Lord has a particular time and prophecies have a particular time when they will come to pass and when it's its time, that's when it's going to happen. Oftentimes, the prophecies tarry from our perspective. I want you to go with me now to, let's go, you go to Matthew chapter number 1 verse number 20. Matthew chapter number 1 verse number 20. I'm going to read you, I'm going to begin in the Old Testament. I just want to go through a few prophecies that tarry. Now, some of these are going to take, they took a, a very long time. Now, as I said, they're going to tarry from our perspective. The Lord wasn't just waiting to bring it to pass. It had a particular time. Many years went by before these prophecies were fulfilled. <clears throat> the, really, one of the very first prophecies that were prophesied of took 
4,000 years to come to pass. One of the very first prophecies that the Lord prophesied of directly from his own mouth took 4,000 years to come to pass and that was the birth of Jesus Christ which would, that is God or the Messiah being born. That the Messiah would come of mankind and be born. Genesis chapter number 3 verse number 15 says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou Thou shalt bruise his heel. That's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ coming, the Messiah coming and being born of mankind and defeating Satan. Now, the ultimate fulfillment of that takes place even still in the future. We're still waiting on that. So the, the, the uh, first application, the spiritual application, of course, when Jesus Christ came and was born of a man in the first place. Look with me at Matthew chapter number 1. Look at verse number 20. Matthew chapter 1 verse number 20. Uh, it says in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord peered unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So obviously this is the fulfillment of the Messiah coming to the earth. And what we see here specifically is we see the, the woman. And that is obviously who the Lord was speaking to, and that is who this prophecy would come through, is that the Messiah would come of the line of mankind, of a woman that would be on this earth, and the Messiah would be born of that woman. Now, what we see here is that being fulfilled through Mary. And we see Jesus Christ, He who is going to tread upon the serpents, if you will. He is the one that's being born here and fulfilling this particular prophecy. Now, when we read of that, the timing in which that took place was 4,000 years ago. This is what the Bible teaches, that it was 4,000 years prior to the Lord Jesus Christ actually coming and being born. Uh, go to, uh, flip over right there where you're at to just Matthew 2, may not even have to turn a page. I want you to go back to Micah in the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Micah. Right after Jonah, if you find Jonah, that's where we have been uh, in our Bible studies. Recently just finished that. Go to Micah chapter number 5. Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2. Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2, <clears throat> the Bible says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So it's prophesied there that the Messiah is going to come out of Bethlehem. That's what it teaches there in uh, Micah chapter number 5 verse number 2 that the ruler is going to come out of Bethlehem. I want you to look now at Matthew chapter number 2 verse number 1. It says this, Now when Jesus was born, watch this, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, we, you know, we just read in our Bibles, we just pick up our Bibles, and you know, Micah in our Bible is just a few, you know, maybe 30 pages or something, 25 pages from Matthew chapter number 2. But you don't think of how long, the long period of time that took place from, from the time of the minor prophets, which are in chronological order within their own little category there, was about 200 years from the time of Micah being on earth until you have Jesus Christ being born. So you have 200 years, a gap of 200 years where this prophecy is prophesied of, of the Lord Jesus Christ being born in Bethlehem. You have an even bigger gap if you do this. Go to Micah chapter number 1. I'll read to you from Genesis chapter number 12. I'm just going to go through some of these right now pretty quick. Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 3 says, And I will bless them that bless thee. This is the Lord speaking to Abram. And curse him that curseth thee. And then he says, And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now we're told that that particularly is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to be born through the seed of Abram, or what we, who we know as Abraham. Look at Matthew chapter number 1. I want you to look down at verse number 2. We'll, we'll read verses 1 and 2. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, 
the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Now, as I said, just because we have the Bible, it's easy for us to look back after these prophecies have been fulfilled and say, oh, that makes perfect sense. But you have to look at it from Abraham's perspective, that the Lord came to Abraham and he said, hey, of you I'm going to make uh, you know, a, 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 a large nation, right? He says a few different ways, exceeding great nation. And in you all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He comes to him at an old age and tells him, I'm going to make a great nation of you. And then we know that many years went by and he didn't even have a child. And obviously, how would this be from Abraham's perspective? When all he has is just this prophecy that he's waiting on to come to pass, that there's going to be many nations. Put your feet down and sit normal. There's going to be many nations that are going to come to pass, right? Or that are going to come about from him, right? Obviously, he's looking and he's like, when is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? We know that Abraham obviously had Isaac. And then Isaac had who? Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Isaac didn't have just all of a sudden this massive nation. Well, if you go to, I'm not going to turn there, I'm going to skip this, but Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 9, is where Isaac receives that same promise of a prophecy that of him there's going to be, a, you know, just this huge nation, right? This great nation and all nations are going to be blessed within him from this nation. So when Isaac ends up having his kids, you know how many kids he ends up having? Two. So how would that seem to Isaac? Obviously confusing, just like it was to Abraham. He doesn't have the whole Bible. That's all that he's been given is just that individual prophecy that in him all nations are going to be blessed because he's going to make of him an exceeding large nation. Then we have Numbers chapter 24, verse number 7, where the promise is given to Jacob. We see the same promise given to Jacob where he is going to have this nation, this huge nation, coming about from him. Now, if you look there in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 2, you see that lineage of Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And we can ultimately see this coming to pass in the New Testament of him being born, of the Messiah being born from that line, from Israel. Look at Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23. Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23. Right now I'm going over some of the prophecies that tarried in regards to the Messiah. Some of these prophecies took thousands of years to come to pass. Many people are like, when is the Messiah? How many people do you think there were that were, that were waiting within the nation of Israel, those that had heard of the Messiah, that were thinking, is, it ever, is the Messiah ever going to come the first time? Is he ever just going to come? Is he ever going to, to appear? Do you think that, that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, do you think that... You know, Judah, do you think that David thought that it was going to be thousands of years in the future before the Messiah had ever come? I'm sure they thought that it was going to happen maybe in just a few generations, maybe within their generation. And I'm sure that there were many people that, that, that were mocking the idea, those that were unbelievers, that were scoffers even of that time of the Messiah's first coming. Mocking and saying, he's never going to come. They could say the same thing about the first coming. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. When is he going to come? You know what? Thousands of years went by. That's what a lot of people don't understand about prophecies. Many, most, of, most prophecies took hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years to come to pass in the Bible. It's not something that just happens the next day. It's not something that just happens within a lifetime even. The, Matthew chapter 1 verse number 23 is a prophecy from Isaiah. It says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This is another prophecy of the Messiah that was fulfilled there in verse number 23. Now, this is actually prophesied of, as many people you probably know, from Isaiah chapter number 7. Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14. That's hundreds of years later. Hundreds. Think about that. That is, you know, and sometimes, as I said, we're just looking at the book of the Bible. But, but think if it's, you know, it took hundreds of years from your lifetime to all of those generations prior to you. Uh, maybe if you could find some particular, you know, ancestor of yours 500 years ago. That's a big gap of time. That's a massive, massive gap of time. That's how long it took for that particular prophecy when it was given to be fulfilled. How do you think people felt when they first heard it, when it was first written down. How do you think they were doing? 
How do you think that they were living their lives? They were thinking, oh, it's, the Messiah's coming soon. The Messiah will be here within my generation or the next generation. Prophecy doesn't work like that. Most of the time, prophecy doesn't work like that. Do you know why God says, hey, though it tarry? Because you're going to feel like it's tarrying. Because oftentimes it takes a long time. And from our perspective, it's true. Prophecy tarries. You know, we're waiting on it to come to pass. Now, God's not waiting for something. God has an appointed time. That's the point. It's speaking of our perspective and God's perspective. From our perspective, it feels like prophecies are tarrying. Abraham felt like the prophecy is just tarrying, right? We're, it's, it's, it's taking its time is basically what that. The word tarry oftentimes is speaking about a man that's, that has something to get done, but he's not necessarily doing it. That's how the word is used in its context most of the time. Someone tarries somewhere. You know, they're waiting somewhere, because they ha but they have to do something, but they're not doing it right away. Well, the Lord has an appointed time. He's not just waiting for something to get it done. He has an appointed time when that's going to take place. Uh, I want you to go now to, let's look at a, a few other things. Let's look at prophecies that were given to Abraham. We'll look at that first one that we just mentioned. Go to Genesis 15. Genesis chapter number 15. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 15, this is where the Lord first comes to him clearly and prophesies to him. It says in Genesis 15 verse number 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. Verse 3, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So as he gives him that promise, and if we were to read forward, we'd see even more so how he preaches the gospel to him, that you know, of him all nations are going to be blessed, right? But back up, I want you to back up to verse number 14. Well, actually, let's go, back to, let's go back to Genesis chapter number 12. Let's make this even more clear. Go back to Genesis chapter number 12. Look at verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now look at verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So we're given the, the, the age of, of Abram at this time. And he's 75 years old. Well, if we go over to Genesis chapter number 21, turn over there with me. Genesis chapter number 21. <clears throat> we, we are told the time in which this is fulfilled and the age that Abram is when this takes place. He's been now given the name Abraham. It says in Genesis 21 verse 1, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. Watch this. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And it says, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So we have a period from 75 to a hundred years old that passed before this actually took place. Now Abraham was told that it was going to happen to him and in his lifetime, right? And there was an immediate fulfillment of this that, that, it, that was basically an indirect fulfillment of what was truly going to come to pass in the future where the Messiah would be born of his seed. So that did take place in his lifetime, but even a prophecy that was given of something that was going to take place in his lifetime did not happen immediately. It took 25 years for this particular prophecy to come to pass. Now, that is a long period of time, especially when God comes to him and says, Hey, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a child. I'm going to give you a son. And he has no children. He has no sons. Now, you would expect, and in, in, in just in our human minds, we would think, Well, God's going to be visiting him and coming to him almost immediately in giving him a child. If he desires for him to have a son, or if he desires for him to have a child, you would think that God would come and give it to him 
the very next day. You would think that God would come and give it to him the very, you know, maybe the next week or that he would appear and all of a sudden he would, he's going to see, I'm sure he was probably looking for Sarah just any minute to start showing to where you were able to tell that now she's having a child. You know, he obviously, and here's the point, he obviously expected it to happen a lot quicker because he ends up stumbling and, and you know, falling into the flesh and trying to bring this prophecy to fruition himself. Because he goes in unto Hagar to have the child. Because he's thinking, oh, I guess it's just not going to happen. Or maybe it just, maybe I need to bring it to pass. Why? Because he thought that the prophecy was tarrying on God's behalf. From his perspective, it's like, man, this is taking way too long. It's waiting. You know, we're waiting way too long for this. But there was an appointed time. And guess what? It would happen and it did happen. It did come to pass. Did it happen immediately? No. A long period of time went by. That's how prophecies are in the Bible many, many times. Go to Genesis 6. Genesis chapter number 6. And we'll see another personal example of a person. Look at Genesis chapter number 6. Look at verse number 13 with Noah. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. So there's when the Lord comes to Noah, and he first pronounces. He tells Noah, I am going to destroy the whole earth. I'm going to destroy the entire earth because of violence that is filled in the earth. And furthermore, I want you, Noah, I want you to build an ark of gopher wood. And he starts to give him all the instructions and the specifications of the ark. A lot of people don't understand how long of a period of time that went by when God came to Noah and gave him this prophecy. Look at Genesis chapter number 6. Look at verse number 3. It says, The Lord. He says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. He's talking about, you know, he, he's, he's of course sending speak, preachers, Noah being an example of that. And he's not always going to put up with this and just be, have this contention where man is just continually you know, being disobedient and you know, living a sinful life. He says, for that he also is flesh. And it says, yet his days, watch this, shall be 120 years. Now when you study this out, it's very clear that this is the time period that it's talking about before he is going to destroy the earth. So when God came to know and he told him, hey, he gave him a prophecy. I'm going to be destroying the whole earth because it's filled with violence. You have to put it into perspective that that didn't happen the next year. That didn't happen in 30 years. Think about that. that it, not even 50 years. He gave him the prophecy and 50 years went by. Think about it from Noah's perspective. I don't know how long it took to build that ark. Obviously it was a big ark. But I have a hard time believing that it took a whole 120 years. I have a very hard time believing that. So, he, you know, he assembles this ark. Let's say it took him 30 years or 40 years. He assembles this ark after 40 years. And you know what he does? He just waits for an additional, what, 80 years. Let's say he assembled it in 70 years. Goodness sakes, that's much more time than you need. 70 years to build this, 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 this huge structure. 70 years. He still has 50 years to wait. 50 years before this prophecy comes to pass. Can you imagine you know, coming to him and saying, like, like being there and, and, and seeing, or, or even Noah telling you, hey, the Lord came to me and said he's going to destroy the whole earth. And then 80 years goes by. What would you think, just put yourself in the shoes of an unsaved man who didn't believe the Bible, and you, and you didn't believe in the God of the Bible, the God of Noah, the God of Adam and Eve that people knew about. And Noah said, hey, God told me he's going to destroy the earth. And then while you, you're still alive, people are living longer at that time, 60 years go by. What would you, what would you think of Noah? You'd think, like, that's not coming to pass. For, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You'd say, it's never going to happen. It's never going to come to pass. 90 years goes by. What do you think people were thinking? It's never going to happen. Give it up, Noah. It, it was wrong. You're not right. It's not true. 
It's the same thing that people just don't understand prophecy. They think that prophecy just comes to pass immediately. That's not how God operates. God, that's just the way. God could have chose to come to Noah, you know, 20 years or 30 years beforehand. And God could have obviously miraculously helped him build the ark. It could have had people come and help him build the ark. Could have given him finances to get someone else. Obviously, I'm just, you know, throwing out things here. But God could have worked it out as the point in whatever way to be able to just come to him right beforehand. God could have just came to Abraham literally like he did right when Sarah conceived. He could have just came to him first then and said, hey, Sarah's going to have a child. Or he could have just came with her and said, hey, Sarah's with child. Couldn't he have? But why didn't he? He chose to come many years prior. Obviously, and I'm not going to preach a sermon on this. It's not the purpose of the sermon this morning. Obviously, the, one of the reasons why he does that is because God desires to build our faith. God takes glory in us trusting in Him through hard times, trusting in Him through the battle. See, not only just getting over one or two battles throughout your life, God enjoys and God gets pleasure out of looking down at His children, trusting them through repeated fights and repeated battles and making it at the end of your life and standing on the mountain and saying, I made it. And still being there after multiple fights, multiple trials, multiple years of tribulation and, and, and all the turmoil that comes with life and, be, and making it through all of that and standing there and then God receives glory from that. That's one of the reasons why is He loves to build our, our patience because it also builds our faith at the same time. Now I want to look at some other ones that are somewhat interesting. I want you to, we're going to look at uh, Jeroboam and Josiah. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 13. 1 Kings chapter number 13. <clears throat> we'll look at some of the examples in the book of Kings. 1 Kings chapter number 13. Look at verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter number 13, verse number 1. It says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay a hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it, pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Now, if you're familiar with the time period right now, Jeremiah actually became king immediately at the same time as Rehoboam. It was right after Solomon. So that's where we're at. We're like at the very beginning still, uh, the early stages of Israel. And really, this is where Israel and Judah actually split. So what we have is we have you know, uh, uh, King Saul and then David, Solomon, and Jeroboam then becomes king. Of Israel, that is. While Rehoboam then became king you know, over when the kingdom split of Judah. So it's in the very early stages of the nations of Israel and Judah and actually the very beginning of and the inception of Judah when they split. Now... <clears throat> If you're familiar with when Josiah reigns, I want you to go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter number 23. When Josiah reigns, it's actually 95 years. If you add up the, the, the amount of years of their reign, it's my, 95 years throughout just the reign. Now, I don't know, and I didn't add up their certain, uh, their particular uh, uh, ages, each person, person's ages, but I just added up the reign of each individual person. And it's 95 years that go by of other people reigning. And that's including Jer Jeroboam. So I want you to turn, as I said, to 2 Kings chapter number 23. 2 Kings chapter number 23. So he prophesied there that that particular altar that was not of God, 
that where they were altering unto you know, false gods, he had set up this golden calf, right? And they're going there and they're offering upon this altar unto false gods. He, he, he prophesied that, there, that the priests would be taken of those false gods and burnt upon that altar. Now I want you to look with me as I said at 2 Kings chapter number 23 verse number 15 is when this actually is fulfilled. It says, Moreover the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nabat who made Israel to sin had made. Both that altar and the high place which he break down that he, I'm sorry, uh, both that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder, and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers, watch this, and burned them upon the altar and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Now there's a couple of things I want you to understand about prophecy from this passage. I want to give you, and this is... Super, super important what I'm about to say. Extremely important, so make sure everybody's paying attention very clearly. There's a couple of things about prophecy that are very, very important. Now, number one, I want to show you that prophecies, which is the theme of the whole sermon, do not come to pass immediately. Often, very often times, it's many, many years later. Now here it's virtually a hundred years that, took, that went by before this prophecy came to pass. And we're just picking out some random prophecies of when they were fulfilled. Right? There are times where they'll come to pass within someone's lifetime if for whatever reason it pertains to those specific people. But oftentimes prophecies that are given from the Lord when they're prophesied of, they don't come to pass for hundred, hundreds, sometimes many times thousands of years before they come to pass. But right here we have an example of a prophecy that came to pass a hundred years later. Now, when he heard that prophecy, what were the specific things that he said that were going to be fulfilled. That's what's interesting about this particular prophecy. The man of God came and he preached and he said, hey, he said, this altar is going to be destroyed. It's going to be cast down and there's going to be a man by the name Josiah that's going to do it. And what he's going to do is he's going to cast down the altar and he's going to take the bones of all these priests and he didn't even say, I don't believe the bones. I can't remember. We'd have to look back and, and go back and look at it. I, you know, you can do that maybe after the sermon. But he said the priests. He so said he's going to offer these priests upon this altar. Now, when would you assume that that's going to take place? You'd think that would happen in that lifetime. You'd think that that's going to happen soon. Those priests are probably like living the rest of their lives like, oh, crap. Whenever I die... I'm going to die by being offered upon this altar. I'm going to be like a burnt sacrifice or a burnt offering. That's how you would probably understand it, right? Well, that's not how it happened. Those priests just lived a normal, regular life. And because that was what they dedicated their life doing, you know, oftentimes like priests do at Catholic churches, where are they buried? At their church, right? Right there where their temple is, right there where their, all of that things. So those priests, that's where they lived. That's where they dedicated their life. So what happened was when Josiah was born, he came to Bethel. He destroyed everything. And all those priests that had served all those years, their bones were buried there because that's where they worked. That's where their lives were spent. That's what they dedicated their lives doing. He gathered up their bones after they've been dead for 100 years and he took their bones and threw it on the altar and burned their bones on the altar. Now, what do you think many people said after those priests died about that prophecy? How do you think people felt? must not have been true. It must not have happened. But notice that there was a little twist to the story there, but this is the other point that I want you to understand. When God prophesies something to come to pass, it comes to pass to a T. It comes to pass exactly how He says it. And people will oftentimes, and when you look at the Word of God, sometimes you may not understand it exactly. And from your perspective, it may seem like, how is that going to be, how is that going to come to pass? How is that going to come true? You know, but it will come to pass to a T if you just believe the Lord. And I'm sure there are many people that were just like, you know what? It almost feels like this isn't even possible now that these priests are dead, but I still believe the Word of God. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that it's like people will present you with all this other evidence. They'll, they'll try to argue against the Word of God. And in your mind, you're trying to reason it out and make sense of it. There's many things like this. But you're like, you know what? I still believe the Word of God. I still believe the, the Lord anyways. Anyways. You know, like uh, when Jesus comes back. 
And it says that every eye shall see him. Now, a lot of people come up with all these theories. Like the earth is flat, right? They come up with all these theories of how this is going to be possible. And they look around, they're like, how is this possible? How is every eye going to see him? You know what? I don't understand exactly. I'm not exactly possible, positive how every single eye is going to see him. But you know what? I am positive that it's true. I don't need to understand that exactly. Now looking back in this story that, you know, after the priest had died, you know, you could understand how somebody would be like, what in the world? You know, and maybe even reading through it, even if you read through it and, and like many year, generations go by, you might be thinking like, like scratching your head thinking, I thought that prophecy was supposed to take place. Those priests must be dead. We're in like three generations now after. You know, those four generations that have went by, those guys have to be dead by now. I thought that prophecy was going to be fulfilled. And then all of a sudden it's like, and then Josiah comes to reign. And you're like, oh man, here we go. Here's the, here's the man that, that's given the name Josiah, the king that's given the name Josiah. But you're still probably thinking, how is that possible? Those guys are dead. He throws down the altar and then somebody's like, hey, look at that. Hey, Josiah, look at that. There's the names of those priests. There's all of those priests that the man of God prophesied and said that their, their bodies are going to be burned on that. You know, he's like, you know what he says? Go ahead and gather up all their bones. Takes all their bones and throws it on the altar and burns all their bones. Prior to that, people have been like, this prophecy can't even come to pass anymore. But guess what? That's why you just believe the Lord anyways. That's why it says, surely it will come to pass. You may reason out. You may lean upon your own understanding. But you need to trust in the Lord with all your heart. You need to believe the word of God because it will come to pass. I guarantee there were people that scoffed about that. And were like, those guys are dead. I guarantee you there were people that said, that's not even true. Those priests even... And what about the priests that came after them? They know about the word of God and what everybody... Here's the thing. This, uh, these men that were with Josiah knew of. They said that's the bodies of, that the, uh, of the priests that the men of God prophesied of. So this was common knowledge that people just knew about this. So there were many people that scoffed and mocked, I'm sure, that, hey, this is never going to come to pass. It's not possible now. But guess what? It came to pass to a T. Many people will try to answer and this, think about Abraham. These are good, really good, important principles right now. Think about Abraham. He saw the, pro he was given the prophecy. He knew the prophecy. Hey, I'm going to be a father of many nations. And I'm going to have a child. Abraham, he still believed the word of God. But you know what he tried to do? He tried to like, kind of like, make it more of like, where it wasn't literal. Maybe it's not that I'm going to be having it through Sarah. Maybe it's just Sarah's my wife. And, you know, Hagar is the one that I should have it with, and me and Sarah will just like raise the child, right? No, it's literal, Abraham. I want you to notice that. The prophecy is literal. We don't need you to just kind of like contort it because you have problems with understanding what it's saying. Because you can't perfectly wrap your mind around and rationalize particular verses in the Bible. Or if you can't make sense of something, or even in your brain, if it's just like, hey, I don't feel like that's possible. You know what you need to do? Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord because he's right every time. Abraham stumbled in his faith. Why? Because he was having trouble understanding how it was possible that that was going to come to pass. These men, I'm sure, they, you know, many people probably thought, I guess that's not, not going to come to pass. But guess what it did anyways. Surely it will come to pass. You must believe the Lord anyways. Go to 1 Samuel chapter number 2. So we saw there a hundred years that went by. One hundred years before that prophecy came to pass. And it even spoke of specific men that were going to be altered, offered on an altar. But it was their bones that were altered, offered many years later. Go to 1 Samuel chapter number 2. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. <clears throat> Just giving you some examples here. And this is actually going to be, this is going to be our last example. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 2. Look with me. No, we have one more after this. 1 Samuel chapter number 2, verse number 27. <clears throat> it says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father? They, uh, uh, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house. And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? 
talk, speaking of Levi, of course. Eli is of the uh, uh, Levites. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now, the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. So he's, he's basically prophesying right there that he's going to kill and destroy the entire seed. He's going to, and, and you know, that's, a, that's a somewhat of a, um, a daunting thing to think of that, you know, at, at some point I'm going to come and I'm just going to kill everyone that is related to your family. I'm going to cut your arm off. So if you think of Levi as being the body, this whole line and offspring that comes from Eli is just going to be totally missing. And that means that all of the Levites that come are going to have to come from some other family. That you, you know, you're not going to have any offspring or any generations that will come to pass after you that will carry on your name. I'm going to totally get rid of all of them. Well, I want you to uh, turn to now, I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter number 2. 1 Kings chapter number 2. Now this never took place in his lifetime. Not only did it not take place in his lifetime, but it was three, almost four generations afterwards. So Eli lived with Saul at the same time as Saul. He was contemporary with Saul, of course, and, and actually died while Saul was still very young. That's why I say basically four generations. Three, almost four generations. You would say four, I guess, if you're speaking of specifically Eli, because he was in a generation prior to Saul. So you have Eli, you have Saul, you have David, and then you have Solomon. I want you to look at 1 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 27, when this actually uh, is fulfilled. It says, look at verse 26, and, Abi and unto Abiathar the priest said the king, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. But I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou bearest the ark of the Lord God before David my father, and because thou hast been afflicted in all wherein my father was afflicted. Look at verse 27. So Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he spake concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. So I want you to notice what took place there. That Eli, was his, his, his seed here, was totally cut off 100% from serving in the house of the Lord. Now when was this fulfilled? When was this actually fulfilled? During Eli's lifetime, was it even Eli's children? No. It took place by the hands of Solomon, which was three, four generations, basically. You know, three generations after Eli, but a fourth generation from Eli himself, where Solomon is the one who actually fulfilled this. So that four generations is a long, long period of time. If you think of when Eli was born in the beginning of Eli serving. He was the last, you know, uh, 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 the, or the last generation that served here was, as we read, was Abiathar the priest. No one served after that. That was it. So three generations, that's roughly 75 years for this prophecy to be fulfilled. Let's look at one more. I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter number 21. So these are just random prophecies that I'm choosing out here. I could go to so many others and so many more prophecies. I wanted to hit on some interesting prophecies here towards the end uh, that weren't necessarily related to the Messiah or things that you were probably very familiar with. We could go through all of the prophecies of the Messiah and it would take an extremely long time because there are so many. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 21. We're going to look at verse number 20. So this is Elijah prophesying now. Verse number 20, it says, And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, saying his children, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, 
the son of Nabat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Aijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, so here's a prophecy of Jezebel. First he said he's going to totally wipe out all of those of Ahab. Now with Eli, in the way in, in which he cut him off was that he was never able to serve as a priest anymore going forward. His name would be totally cut off from serving as a priest. Now here with Ahab, he's telling him that he's actually going to kill all of his children, all of his offspring. But here's the prophecy of Jezebel now. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. I want you to turn now to, uh, let's see the fulfillment of this. Go over to, to 2 Kings chapter number 8. 2 Kings chapter number 8. <clears throat> And this was 30 to 40 years difference if you add up at the time period. It's, it's when Elisha was uh, alive and, and the prophet. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 8. We're going to look at verse number 10. 2 Kings chapter number 8 verse number 10. We'll see the fulfillment of uh, Ahab. 2 Kings chapter number 8 verse number 10. <clears throat> and it says, And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest cer certainly recover. Howbeit the Lord has showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly, and, and he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Isaiah said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their I'm sorry, this is a, I'm pretty sure this is the wrong passage. Go to maybe I was in 2 Kings 7. I said 8, right? We were in 8 just now. Look at... Oh, that's not... Verse number 9, maybe? Yeah, here it is. Look at, look at 2 Kings chapter 9. I wrote down the wrong chapter here. I was on the wrong page. 2 Kings chapter number 9, look at verse number 10. It says in... Uh, uh, Let's, let, let's back up a little bit, actually. Let's read a little bit more of the context here. Let's look at uh, 2 Kings 9. Look at verse number 4. So the young man, even the young man and the prophet, went to Ramoth-Gilead. When he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, unto, unto which of all, all us? And he said, to thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the, over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the, house, for the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Aijah, and the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So we can see there where he is, uh, uh, we see the man here that is actually selected to go forth is Jehu. And he is the one that's going to be fulfilling this particular prophecy. Now this is, uh, you know, the, the, the next man that's going to be taking place after Ahab. And I want you to keep in mind that Elijah, the prophet, was the one that prophesied of this. And he stood there and looked into the whites of the eyes of uh, uh, Ahab and he saw Jezebel. He also saw Jezebel. He knew both of these people and he prophesied to Ahab these things that Ahab was going to be cut off and that Jezebel was going to be cut off and both of them were going to be killed and both of them were going to be destroyed. But it never took place in his lifetime. When he lived at the same time as these people, he was alive at the exact same time, but Elijah actually did not die. This is after Elijah had left the earth. Elijah was carried up in a whirlwind. So here we see Jehu, who by Elisha was anointed to go forth and to fulfill these particular things. I want you to go over and look at 2 Kings chapter number 9. Now, 2 Kings chapter number 9, uh, verse 37. So same chapter, verse 37. <clears throat> look at verse number 37. It tells us, And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, 
This is Jezebel. Now, back up, let's read verse number 36 as well. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servant Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. Now he's saying, he's making the statement, This is the word of the Lord because it just was fulfilled. Just prior to that, we're not going to read the whole entire context, but just prior to that, this was fulfilled. And, it, it, and what did it do? It was a generation later. It took place a generation later. It wasn't right at the same time of Elijah. It took place when Elisha the prophet was alive on the earth. And uh, we see Jehu is at the hands of Jehu. Now I want you to turn back to 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Second Peter chapter number 3. Now, these are all prophecies that were prophesied of, but they've already come to pass. These were things that were prophesied of and fulfilled. All the ones that I used as examples. And I want you to notice that these prophecies took many years to come to pass. Now, if we look in regards to the Messiah, the prophecies of the Messiah, the majority of those took thousands of years to come to pass. Thousands of years to come to pass. You know, some of them that like, when you see mankind, the one that's given to Adam, that's 4,000 years. We see the prophecies that are given afterwards. You know, the one to Noah uh, that relate to you know, the gospel. The one that's given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's still thousands of years. Thousands of years before they came to pass. The prophecies that we're waiting on now are all in relation to the second coming of Christ. That's what we're waiting on to come to pass. Now, how long ago were... These prophecies, you know, a lot of them given, you know, some of them are even from the Old Testament, but the last prophecies that were given of Christ's return were when? The last, you know, revelations from the Lord were 2,000 years ago. Do you know what people have the inclination to say, those that don't believe the Bible? They would have, you know, they would be just like how those scoffed at Noah, saying it's never going to come to pass. Those that scoffed after those, those priests were dead, that were serving under Jeroboam, you know what they would say? It's never going to come to pass. Those that maybe didn't believe the word of the Lord, but they knew that there were prophecies of the Messiah to come. And, you know, for the first prophecy of the Messiah, you know, comes to Eve. And then you have the nation of Israel that's established, and you have these, these continual prophecies that are added to Scripture and added to the word of the Lord that the children of God are receiving, just numerous prophecies that are coming. And you know what people's tendency was? to just mock at it, to scoff at it, and to say that it was never going to come to pass. But guess what? The first coming actually did come. So just as it says, surely it will come. Though it tarry, surely it will come. Just like it says in Habakkuk chapter number 2. Now you're in 2 Peter chapter number 3. This is what I want to end with. 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. We'll keep reading there. We read verse number 4 before. It says in verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Then it says in verse number 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So there's something in specific that he doesn't want us to be ignorant of in regards to fulfilled prophecy to come and the time that goes by. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, as one day. So notice that he's explaining that, that time is irrelevant to God. You know, but one day, like if we were to think of like one day for us and then a thousand years to us, there's a massive difference there, isn't there, between a day and a thousand years? There's a hugely ma massive difference in time. You know, uh, one day to us, I mean, we could, we could you know, measure that into a 24-hour period. Now, you know, how many 24-hour periods go by in a thousand years? It's, it's a hugely massive difference. But in, in regards to God... It's com completely and totally irrelevant. Why? Because God dwells outside of time. Because God is eternal. So the point is that God isn't just like waiting as we wait. God isn't like tarrying like we tarry. God obviously intervenes into time and space and matter which we dwell in. He'll intervene into our, you know, uh, 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 our concept of time in this world. 
But obviously, God isn't in heaven like, you know, like it's 2020 in heaven and we have to wait till this period of time before this takes place. That's not how it works with God. So what he wants you to understand is that God isn't waiting on this timeline or on this clock before he comes. That's irrelevant to the Lord. But we know that God has an appointed time for these things. God has an appointed time when he is going to come back. And notice how it mentions, isn't it interesting that it mentions, it actually mentions here a thousand years. That to us, you know, we wait a day and we're like, well, maybe he's coming back tomorrow. Maybe he's coming back today, right? And we're sitting here waiting and we can grow impatient, but the Lord does not grow impatient. But notice, as I said, it mentions a thousand years when it mentions a day there. It mentions a thousand years in respect to uh, the Lord's return. How many years has it been since these prophecies of the Lord coming back? It's been around 2,000 years. Now, how, how much time went by from His first coming? From the prophecies to His first coming? Some of them 4,000 years. So is it too hard to believe or too big of a pill to swallow to think that there would be a couple of thousand years from the prophecies in the time of His first coming to His second coming? When there were 4,000 years that went by from the prophecies to actually his first coming, coming to fruition? Of course not. And not only that, we actually have a passage where he, it's implicit in the passage that, hey, it's just like a thousand years to him. What does that kind of you know, uh, uh, denote to you? That maybe it might take a thousand years at least, or maybe a couple before he comes back. Not only that, why would it specifically mention in the Bible that, hey, you know, there's going to be scoffers in the last days. They're going to say, hey, why hasn't he come back? What does that denote? That his coming is going to what? That it might tarry from our perspective. Maybe it doesn't come, you know, immediately. I'm sure that John and all of them were expecting Christ to come back at any moment. I can tell so by, by John's writings. You know, even so, come quickly. What's he saying? Come in my lifetime. I want all these events to take place in my lifetime. But, you know, obviously God doesn't work on our, on our terms or on our scale. He's not, he's, not, he's not tarrying in the same sense that we're tarrying. So notice there that he, he goes ahead and he tells you, hey, it's like a thousand years to him, right? But I want you to flip over and let's look at that, Revelation chapter number 22. What we're waiting on now, what people will scoff and mock at now is, like it says, you know, when is he going to come? When is he going to come back? He said that he's going to come back for, for you know, Many, many years now, thousands of years now. At the end of Revelation chapter number 22, you know, it, it makes that statement. It says, he, testify, he which testifieth these things saith, notice this, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So notice even John afterwards, as I said, he says, you know, even so, come Lord Jesus. So in Jesus' mind, you know, I, that's a weird way to word that, but from Jesus' perspective, from God's perspective, he says, surely I come quickly. You know, notice that. Is he tarrying? He's not tarrying. He's coming at his appointed time. He's coming when it's time for him to come. Uh, Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 3, again it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. And it says, and not lie. Saying it's, it's going to come to pass. It will come to pass. He goes for, further and it says, Though it tarry, wait for it. Saying, though it doesn't happen right away, though many years go by, maybe thousands, yea, go by. It says, though it tarry, wait for it. Watch this. But it will surely come. That's, you know, obviously speaking about the, all of these events that are recorded. But there's a clear reference there to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes further and says, It will not tarry. You know what you see there is also that reference to, surely I come quickly. Saying he's, he's not tearing. From his perspective, he's not tearing, tearing. The overall principle of this morning's sermon is more of like a Bible study. What I want you to take away from it is this. I want you to understand and take away from the sermon that prophecies do not come to pass immediately. Prophecies in the Bible, they often come to pass many, many years later. Sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of years later. And when people think like, oh... You know, Jesus, you know, people have always thought that Jesus were going to come back. And look at all the years that went by. You could have said the same thing about Jesus' first coming. 
Prophecies oftentimes, from our perspective, tarry, but not from God's perspective, because there is an appointed time. We have to trust in the Lord, and we have to believe the Bible. You know, even in moments of doubt and things along those lines, or in the face of scoffers and things along those lines. Why? Because we know that the Bible is true. Obviously, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We know that these things are true, and that what you know, the God of, of what God's word and and uh, these things that He prophesied of. So we, we need to look at all of these situations where we see men of God from the Old Testament enduring through hard times while they're having to wait on the Lord to fulfill these prophecies. We have to believe the Lord and we can, in, we can uh, uh, grow in patience and we can grow in endurance. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for uh, being faithful and that we know that we can trust you, that you will bring it to pass, dear Lord, all of the things that have been prophesied of. We ask you that you be with us through the rest of the day, dear Lord, that you would uh, bless us, uh, be with the, the families that are here, be with Mrs. Hall. She's not feeling well this morning, that she would feel better, dear God. We love you and just uh, continue to bless us and be with us, as I said, in Jesus Christ's name, amen.